I'm going to be talking about um, human embryonic stem cell and iPS-based product development. And um, I thought I would start out with a rather candid appraisal of where the field's at, and specifically uh, some of the work that we're doing to try to uh, 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 jump over some of those hurdles. Now, uh, several of the talks you've heard today uh, have been about uh, pluripotent stem cells, the embryonic and iPS cells that can branch off into the... By the way, I don't, where did someone come up with 200 cell types in the human body? I mean, the, I think everyone gets it off from Wikipedia, you know, the authoritative scientific source for the whole world. There, there are well over a thousand different cell types in the human body. Uh, there's 50 distinguishable, five zero, 50 distinguishable cell types in the retina, just in the retina alone. And all of you guys know the, all the different types of blood cells and so on. Uh, so the problem with pluripotency is it's linked to the opportunity. Uh, the fact that these cells will branch out and make all the cells of the human body is just a, an amazing and challenging and wonderful thing. Uh, but here, you know, as we, we try to dig down into the practical and commercial uh, opportunities and product development opportunities, the challenges are that complexity. I mean, it's, wow. You know, I, I, I sometimes make reference, if any of you are cell biologists or spend any time in the lab, you're in a stem cell lab. Everyone has this chart. They get it from one of the suppliers here uh, dis out in the displays. Uh, they put on the refrigerator doors of hematopoiesis, you know. I, we saw one uh, previous speaker, so you see the hematopoietic stem cell and all these lineages. If you were to map out all the lineages that come from a pluripotent stem cell, on a similar scale, it would fill a football field and more. I mean, these are really complex cells. The human body is amazingly complex. So I made my point, right? So how do we make just one cell type on a commercial scale? And, you know, for years, I, as one of the people in this field, said, you know, well, we'll figure that out. And um, I want to drill down a bit on that because that's really what we've been working on at Biotime, and I, I think these are significant challenges. So first, I've got up here some of the challenges. Uh, you know, histocompatibility is a major challenge, and uh, the twin strategies I'm referring to there is, you know, IPS versus ES as a patient-specific versus allogeneic strategy. But these, these bullet points beneath that are really the ones I want to talk about mostly today. Scalability, reproducibility, purity, identity. And then how do we generate such products where we have achieved purity and identity and so on uh, with sufficient diversity for a, a, a biotech company or companies to have a reasonable choice of products to identify you know, in product selection, where we go through this process of saying, okay, what are the unmet needs? What's our intellectual property position on this product? And so on, that we have enough products in front of us that we can really hit a home run here. And of course, where are the near-term commercial opportunities? Because biotech always struggles with the long-term timelines for these products. So I'll start by talking about the complexity. So on the top, I'm showing you how um, many of us thought early on about how we would be making products from an embryonic stem cell and then later, of course, from an iPS cell. And it's not pretty. So, look, so the concept was we'd make products just the way we've, in biotech, always made products uh, like recombinant proteins and so on. We'll scale up the cell source. So if it's Cho cells or you know, hybridomas for antibodies, whatever these cells are, we'll have these big stainless bioreactors and we'll scale up the source, for instance, the embryonic stem cell, and then we'll hit those cells with signals that send them toward endoderm or mesoderm, and then more specifically to the lineages that we want. The problem has been, as you may have heard, and it continues to be, purity. You can get fooled by this very easily. You look in uh, all the leading scientific journals, and they'll always have, you know, a blazing headline about how easy it was to make 
some specific cell type of the human body, and they'll show beautiful color photos. But try doing that in a biotech company to make clinical grade product. It's not generally a reproducible event. You can make it work and get photos for a scientific paper, but make it happen lot to lot and make clinical grade product, it's really a challenge. And so what I'm going to introduce you to um, uh, is the uh, my second generation manufacturing technology, which we, we've been working with. Very simple conceptually. And the, co the concept is, let's go one step downstream of a pluripotent stem cell into the lineages that branch immediately branch out of those cells that we call embryonic progenitors. Embryonic because they're still very primitive in their gene expression. In many cases, they're the equivalent of uh, paraxial mesoderm, the very primitive mesoderm that hasn't even yet begun to form the condensations that make the vertebrae and things in the back. Very primitive lineages, so hence embryonic, uh, and progenitors because these cells are not really stem cells in the sense that there's a, a counterpart in the human body as a stem cell. They're an in vitro progenitor. Uh, akin to the blood cell progenitors, and so that's how we named them that, and they're clonal. Now, I'm showing you this rather crazy image. As a, as a public biotech company, I, we have to put all these uh, images on our website, you know, and all that, and I was, frankly, a little sheepish about showing something from a carnival on our corporate website, but I wanted to make a point to, to you as an audience. So as we think about, as a cell biologist, you know, how we're going to make product, on the left is a, the branching tree of just a very primitive map of development. Obviously, real human development is much more complex. On the right is how I think about that tree from a development perspective. And where I came up with this is I took my kids to uh, Great America, which is outside of San Francisco, and my son, was in front of one of these things, and the box at the bottom had the big teddy bear up, up in there, and he wanted it, and he would throw the ball right up at the top above that box, and every time he threw the ball, it ended up going wildly diverged at the bottom. And I realized this is our problem with pluripotency, is lot-to-lot -lot variability. It's well known. You identify a protocol to make your product, and every time you put human ES cells into that exact same protocol, they diverge and make, what, what's the heck this time? It's all beating heart muscle. It's supposed to be neurons. What the heck is going on? And there, it's just like the, these games. There's so many fate decisions that these cells go through to go from pluripotency down to a final differentiated cell type is it's really not a reproducible uh, manufacturing method. And so what we did instead, the second generation manufacturing technology, is we cloned out from single cells the downstream embryonic progenitors, which are also all highly proliferative lineages. But now we have cells like those red arrows I showed you from that tree that are still highly proliferative, they're still progenitors, but they've committed themselves to becoming a specific and generally site-specific type of tissue. As you know, there's, besides the differentiated states of cells, there's site-specific regulatory genes like the homeobox genes that regulate, if it's cartilage, for instance, whether it's going to be a, a soft type of cartilage, elastic cartilage of the ear versus a harder type of cartilage of the, of a, like in the cartilage in your uh, jaw, the hardest uh, hyaline cartilage in the body. Very close embryologically, but very different mechanically. So the idea of growing clonal embryonic progenitors allowed us to get at um, much more precisely uh, the different cell types we wanted. And as we began to work with this, we recognized that it was possible to generate over 200 progenitors, different kinds of progenitors to the cells of the human body. A lot of diversity, the, these cells are scalable, kind of like a fibroblast, they can be scaled up, or like, like these mesenchymal stem cells you've been hearing about. But now by using gen, gene expression microarrays and so on, we get a precise identity and purity, 
And of course, it gave us a great opportunity to file uh, patents for intellectual property position. How can I describe all of these cell types in such a short talk? I can't, but here, just sometimes visually, that is the best way to, uh, to make your point. This is a heat map. And, um, oops, sorry. This is a heat map of gene expression, and I've really collapsed it down to show just uh, in red the highly differentially expressed genes. And uh, you'll notice here, the, which I'm trying to show you, is out of 200 of these uh, randomly chosen clonal embryonic progenitors, the diversity that's there. There was over 140-fold diversity in, in just 200 random clones that we published on. We now have over 200-fold diversity. So the concept is not only identity and purity and scalability uh, improvements here, but to go back to our analogy here, now the number of fate decisions that these cells have to undergo to terminally differentiate is truncated rather dramatically. So these cells, you know, are progenitor to the cartilage of the outer ear. They might be able to become the dermis of the outer ear, but they cannot become a, a midbrain neuron. So what, what we did then, uh, this is, I guess, going back about four to five years, we took these cells out and then exposed them to these last steps of differentiation to map out what we call their fate space. So the fate space of an embryonic stem cell is everything in the body. The fate space of a bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell is a certain kind of cartilage, hypertrophic cartilage, and bone. Um, the fate space of a hematopoietic stem cell is, are the blood cell lineages. What are the, what are the fate space of foregut endoderm or of, uh, you know, the, uh, particularly these lines with a certain uh, Hox gene expression? Can they become uh, lung and liver and pancreas or, or what? And so we began to expose these cells to a wide array of different uh, differentiation signals and again microarray them and, and study their um, differentiation potentials. I'm going to just give you a couple examples here uh, that we've been actively working on. This is, the, uh, this is 100 uh, different clonal progenitors. I know you can't see their names. And, um, and here, this was a screen where we put these cells in high density and gave them one signal, uh, TGF beta 3. Well, gave them dexamethasone too. And, uh, and then we uh, screen just by PCR for different markers, and this marker is collagen 2. Uh, pretty much a marker, I mean, you know, 98, 99 plus percent specific to cartilage. And, uh, you know, you can see out of the 200 lines, we got seven hits. What are those cells? This is one of them. It's uh, most distal Hox gene is Hox B2, which means it's somewhere from here on up in the body. It has some really specific markers I'll show you in a second, BARCS1 and LHX8. Again, homeobox genes that help us, you know, zip code genes that tell us where they are. Here's where these, these are little developing mice. You can see the arrows here. See the yellow arrow? So here's where some of these homeobox genes are expressed. They're, you know, they turn dark blue. And by looking at how these genes are expressed, we can see that where precisely they are in a developing uh, mouse, which is generally correlates to the developing human. And so this line is progenitors to proximal mandibular mesenchyme. So, which the reason I'm showing it to you, this particular cell type, as you can see here in this little heat map, makes beautiful cartilage. Uh, its collagen 2 expression, you know, matches that of MSCs. But you'll note as you go down this little heat map about three quarters of the way down, you'll see collagen 10. MSCs make a huge amount of collagen 10, which is a marker for bone forming cartilage. Cartilage that's, you know, when you break your bone, you get a cartilage plug that holds the bone together. It's called a callus. That's cartilage, it's hypertrophic cartilage, though, that will turn back into bone, and that's what MSCs make. And that's not what we want to make for the joint. We want to make permanent, definitive cartilage that will not turn to bone. 
And you can see this particular line here makes this really hard uh, hyaline cartilage, but it, it, it's in the absence of these hypertrophic markers, which I have at the bottom of the heat map. And these cells are very scalable. On the arrow head and in the arrow, you can see where we did um, a fine structure DNA analysis for genomic stability, looking at uh, um, CNVs. And uh, the cells can be scaled up extensively in vitro and still maintain their, their differentiation potential and their normal genotype. And they make pretty cartilage. So, and this makes my point again about that, I won't belabor this, uh, the absence of these hypertrophic markers. One interesting thing uh, for those that are, of you that are interested in orthopedic applications, the little graph in the top right shows a marker that's often not used for uh, the MSC the bone marrow MSC. Everyone hears about CD90 and all these antigens. They're not specific to anything. They're in virtually every cell of the body. So for those of you that are interested, that, that, that's kind of a hot button for me. The, these markers that people use for an MSC were meant to distinguish them from the blood forming lineages in the bone marrow. They're really not useful at all in telling you what kind of cell type you have. When you see CD90 and so on, Virtually every cell in the human body expresses those markers. Um, but CD74 is a pretty darn specific marker. And here you can see up in that top graph, MSCs make a lot of it. Adipocyte stromal fraction makes a lot of it. None of these chondrogenic progenitors make that marker. So these are not MSCs. These are embryonic progenitors to, in this case, cartilage, uh, cells that have never been isolated or scaled before to our knowledge. Now, once you have these cells and they're scalable, you can do uh, fate-space mapping. And here we're showing how we can optimize the specific kinds of cartilage we want. And we've uh, been doing uh, preclinical work. The goal is to have uh, these cells in the clinic soon. And uh, we've been optimizing them for regenerating uh, various types of cartilage in animal models. I'm going to quickly go through this because I know it's been a long day. And I'm hitting you with a lot of graphs and a lot of data. But I wanted to give you a sense of the power of this technique. This is a, a different uh, osteochondral progenitor. It's ZIC2 positive. You can see the closing neural tube there in the mouse. These are neural crest lineages. It makes 30 to 40,000 times, yes, I said that, 30 to 40,000 times more RNA or transcript for collagen 2 than cultured chondrocytes. Amazingly chondrogenic. You know, in early embryology, there's just a rapid tissue formation. You can see these markers, how we, we study them in microarray. There's a, a chondrogenic line that's very strong for a marker called HAND2, and uh, it makes a lot of bone markers. You can see on the right where that marker is expressed in the skeleton of the developing mouse. Here's a cell line under uh, uh, in our fate space screening. You know, when we gave it BMP4, it turns on uh, tendon markers. Really cool. Um, let's see if I can make this thing advance here. There we go. This is another one we've never shown before. Uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of the variety here. It's so hard in these short talks to you know, talk about everything. This is a cell line, again, in specific conditions which we've identified, turns out, turns on a gene called uh, transthyretin. There, on, I put a little inset for you. This is an image of the developing mouse. You can see it's expressed in the liver of the mouse. And see those little splotches up in the brain? That's the choroid plexus. So these cells don't express this gene. We hit them with a specific signal. They hit that last peg and go bam and they make a highly reproducible and scalable source of the cells of the choroid plexus. Isn't that cool? Why is that important? It's important in Alzheimer's disease, we believe. Uh, so we've divided up a lot of these different products into subsidiaries with disease focus, and uh, one is um, uh, Cell Cure in Israel, uh, also at Hadassah Hospital. Uh, they're making a retinal pigment epithelium for the treatment of macular degeneration. Uh, many of these products we're using uh, use HiSTEM as a delivery device. This is a polymerizable uh, uh, matrix for cell transplantation. The beauty of this is you can inject cells in a liquid form 
and they can polymerize in the body at physiological pH and with no toxic byproducts. It's really a unique hydrogel. It improves the survival post-transplantation of many different cell types that have been studied. If any of you are interested, I'd be happy to collaborate with you on that. We have the exclusive uh, use of that. Uh, so orthocytes focused on uh, orthopedic diseases. We also use um, the Singapore human ESL lines or their clinical grade lines, which we've been sharing with researchers in the state of California under an agreement. Happy to provide them to any of you that are interested. And uh, we do uh, also, for some applications, incorporate reprogramming technologies. And here I'm just showing you how you can, these smears in this uh, southern blot on the left are telomere lengths. So we can reset cell lifespan and telomere length by reprogramming. And we have our own proprietary recite technology for doing that. And um, we think that's important for applications like this. These are, again, clonal progenitors to human vascular endothelium, which we think is going to be very important and uh, we need reprogramming for. So here's a bit what our product portfolio looks like. You know, we have a lot of these different progenitors. We, we offer them for sale as research products, along with this high stem hydrogel. And we're focused in on uh, uh, developing some of these specific uh, applications that we've identified for, uh, for clinical use. So the advantage of clonal progenitors, my pitch at the end of the day, we can really get at purity and scalability and identity, things that are really important if your goal is to make a product long term in a novel way and, uh, and these cells are, uh, they behave themselves uh, unlike, the, so you don't have a circus game as a company. <laughs> That's a good uh, way to end my talk, thank you. I'm happy to take a question or two. Great, thanks. I would have someone just uh, you know, have you compared the progenitor cells from different ES lines versus different IPS lines? And you did a great work with gene expression studies and things like that. So I'm wondering if you do the very same progenitor cell from the human ES versus the same IPS from the skin cell, should they be identical? Are they identical? Or would you expect them? Yeah. You know, that's, uh, we, we've looked at that. You know, we know it's possible to do this with IPS. Um, there, there are so many different cell types here. To, it's not a trivial experiment. To, I mean, this was you know, years worth of work. So to go back and repeat all this and generate all these hundreds of lineages, scale them up, make RNA, microarray them, expose them to differentiation signals. You know, this is, this is 15 person years of work. So you know, we've done it to a limited extent. Um, it, 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 we know we can do it with IPS versus ES. Um, and um, I, I guess I'll just leave it there. It's kind of a complicated uh, answer. You guys are all impatient. It's been a long day. And any other questions? Or? I guess that's it. Thank you, well, thank you everyone. Thank you,